Good morning, Simple Church. It is so exciting and good to be able to meet with you today. We're starting a new series. It's on the seven I am's of Jesus Christ, and they are found in the Gospel of John. Let me tell you what those seven are. Jesus made these statements about himself, and they created some problems for him because it's kind of like he's saying, I am God. But he said, I am the bread of life. I am the gate. I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the good shepherd. I am the true vine. I am the light of the world. And then on Easter Sunday, we're going to see him say, I am the resurrection and the life. We're going to be studying four of these I am's to prepare our hearts for Easter Sunday, which is coming up April 4th. However, before we study four of these I am statements, I thought it would be outstanding to hear John Ortberg. John is one of my preacher heroes. He's a prolific writer. He's the pastor of several churches. He's one of the best storytelling speakers I know. And so today, John is going to help us see Jesus Christ. And what he calls Christ is this, a leader of unimaginable influence. And I believe you and I will learn some truths about this I am, this Jesus Christ, that we have never heard before. This message was delivered before over 200,000 people at the Global Leadership Conference. And I know it will encourage you and give you an even more complete understanding of how wonderful our faith is as we prepare our hearts to see this great I am, Jesus Christ. So. Be blessed. I want, to start, I want to start this talk by giving you kind of a leadership challenge. Suppose you wanted to change the world so much that in 2,000 years, not only would your name be remembered, but your birthday would be celebrated all over the planet. What would you do? Where would you start? It's only happened once. I live 30 minutes south of a city called San Francisco. Why is there a San Francisco? It's because once there was a man named Francis of Assisi who inspired so much generosity and love that people named cities after him, and he did this because of a man named Jesus. I live 30 minutes north of San Jose. Why is there a San Jose? Because once there was a man named Joseph whose life was changed, by a man named Jesus. The capital of our state is Sacramento. Why is there a Sacramento? Because a man named Jesus had a meal to express a staggering idea that God loves so much that he suffers, and that meal became a holy thing, a sacrament. Before that, I lived in Chicago. Why is there a Chicago? No one knows. <laughs> Not even Jesus knows why there is a Chicago. It's just there. You can't look at a map without being reminded of this man. The instrument on which his enemies killed him, a cross, marks more graves, adorns more jewelry, is the single most recognizable symbol in the world. His movement grows even though its leaders are often leadership challenged. And if anybody feels inadequate to lead for Jesus, this is for you. This is from Eugene Peterson. He writes about growing up in a Christian home, but being picked on as the victim of a second-grade bully named Garrison Jones. Peterson writes, I'd been prepared for the wider world of neighborhood and school by memorizing, bless those who persecute you and turn the other cheek. I don't know how Garrison Jones knew that about me, but he picked me for his sport. Most afternoons after school, he would catch me and beat me up. He also found out I was a Christian and taunted me with Jesus sissy. I arrived home most afternoons bruised and humiliated. My mother told me this had always been the way of Christians in the world and that I had better get used to it. I was also supposed to pray for him. One day when I was with seven or eight friends, Garrison caught up with us and started jabbing me. That's when it happened. Something snapped. For a moment, the Bible verses disappeared from my consciousness, and I grabbed Garrison. To my surprise and his, I was stronger than he was. 
I wrestled him to the ground, sat on his chest, and pinned his arms with my knees, and he was helpless. At my mercy, it was too good to be true. I hit him in the face with my fists. It felt good, and I hit him again. Blood spurted from his nose, a lovely crimson in the snow. This is Eugene Peterson, the man that wrote the Message Bible. I said to Garrison, say uncle. He wouldn't say it. I hit him again. More blood. Then my Christian training reasserted itself. I said, say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He wouldn't say it. I hit him again. More blood. I tried again. Say, I believe in Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And he said it. Garrison Johns was my first Christian convert. Walk across that room, pal. <laughs> Jesus' influence endures in spite of those who try to oppose him, often in spite of those who claim to follow him. There's a great historian from Yale, and this is what he wrote. Regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible, with some sort of super magnet, to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? Wherever you are on your faith journey, you have to ask yourself, Whatever you might think about religion or claims of divinity, just consider him simply as a person who was born, who lived and died. Look honestly and without prejudice at his impact on our world. You have to ask, who was this man? There is the world that Jesus experienced, and the ancient world was a much darker and crueler place than most people know. There is the world that Jesus saw, and the beauty of his vision of what could be transformed the human imagination. And then there is the world that Jesus touched. And most people simply have no idea the impact Jesus has had on our world in almost every sphere of life. Too often, we argue about Christianity instead of marveling at Jesus. And we need to marvel because there are millions of people who don't believe in Jesus right now, but they might become admirers of his and then maybe followers. Leaders especially need to expand their vision of Jesus' kingdom impact because we are stewards of that movement, a movement that has reshaped history more than any others, and it is not done. And so for the next few moments... We'll just marvel at Jesus. We'll start by naming the obvious. It would be very hard to choose a less likely candidate to change the world. Jesus never held an office, never led an army, never wrote a book, never traveled abroad. His followers were remarkably unimportant. The New Testament itself records them being called unschooled ordinary men. And yet 2,000 years later, it is impossible to imagine the world without him. To begin with, he gave the world its most influential movement. Imagine a world with no church, no Notre Dame, no St. Paul's Cathedral, no storefront churches in Watts, no house churches in China, no Willow Creek, no gatherings in Africa or Asia or South America, no Peter or Paul or Timothy or Augustine or Aquinas or Mother Teresa or Martin Luther or Joan of Arc or Desmond Tutu. But let's go back to the beginning, to the idea of a church. In the ancient world, there were nations, there were families, there were ethnic groups, there were guilds, there were tribal religions, there were philosophical schools. The church was none of these. Paul says, here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and in all. 
There's a place in California called Disneyland. Anybody ever been on a ride called It's a Small World After All? <laughs> song will drive you crazy after a while. People of every culture, every nationality, every status together. You think about this. Where, before the church, was there a movement that actively sought to include every single human being, regardless of ethnicity, status, language group, wealth, or gender, to be a single transformational community. Not only had there never been such a community before, there had never been the idea of a community like that. It was his idea. And then it happened. Look at people gathering all together for this event. Look at the disparate people that only Jesus could bring together. Jesse Jackson and Jerry Falwell. Jim Wallace, Jim Dobson, and Jimmy Carter. Anne Lamont and Thomas Kincaid. Billy Graham and Billy Sunday and Bill Clinton and Bill Shakespeare. Bono and Bieber and Bev Shea. Galileo, Newton, and Kepler. T.S. Eliot, C.S. Lewis, J.R.R. Tolkien. George Washington, Denzel Washington, George Washington Carver. Constantine, Charlemagne, Sarah Palin, Tony Blair. Barack Obama, John Milton, John Wesley, John Calvin, John Bunyan, John the Baptist, John the Disciple, John of the Cross, Pope John the 23rd, and John Maxwell. <laughs> Who else brings people like that together? And by the way, the 12 steps came directly out of something called the Oxford Group, a community reclaiming the practices of Jesus for transformation. No Jesus, no 12 steps. I'm not saying that apart from Jesus, there never would have been an actionable vision of humankind as family. I'm just saying, as a matter of historical reality, it began with a poverty-stricken, crucified carpenter. Who was this man? Jesus changed how we think about history. Most folks don't know this. In our day, we expect to see progress. It's the task of leaders. We'll do surveys. Do you think life will be better for the next generation? Nobody in the ancient world would have asked that question. Most cultures thought of existence in terms of cycles, just an endless repetition of ups and downs. Events were dated by rulers. Year one of the reign of Augustus and so on. But over time, the power of every Caesar and their grip on the human imagination faded, while another vision grew more compelling. By the 6th century, a Scythian monk proposed a new calendar that was based not on the founding of Rome, but on the birth of Jesus. And the creation of the calendar was not just a chronological convenience, it was a claim. It was an idea that life is not a random cycle, that it has a meaning, that it's leading somewhere, and that its critical event is the life of this Jewish carpenter. Jesus lived and died, and Caesar never heard a hint of his existence. But Jesus was called by his disciple John, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. You all understand, that's not just a poetic phrase. The idea is, take all the kings, all the leaders that have ever been around, put them in a group. Jesus is the king over them. He's not just a king. He's not even the greatest king. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. Now, in the first century, while he had only a small group of followers, such a claim seemed laughable. And maybe it still does to you. I understand that. But I'll tell you one thing, if you were around back then and you had to bet on whose influence would last longer, Jesus or the Roman Empire, you would not put your money on the carpenter and his motley crew. And yet today, 2,000 years later, we give our children names like Peter, Paul, and Mary, and we give our dogs names like Caesar and Nero. <laughs> 
2,000 years after this man's birth, every time any human being anywhere on the planet looks at a date, we are reminded daily that Jesus Christ has become, in fact, the hinge of history, that Nero died in the year of our Lord, 68, that Napoleon died in the year of our Lord, 1828, that the that the dictator Joseph Stalin died in the year of our Lord, 1953. Maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus was not the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. But how strange is it that now every ruler who ever reigned, every nation that rises and falls must be dated in reference to the life of Jesus. Who was this man? <laughs> Jesus would change how the world shapes, expresses compassion. Now, all human beings have a capacity for compassion. This has always been true. But Jesus shaped this in ways that we often do not know about. In ancient Greece and Rome, it was generally the beautiful and the noble and the strong that were admired. The wealthy might give money for public works, but it was generally a way to demonstrate the rich man's greatness. The weak and the marginal were not generally valued in the ancient world. A first century Roman writer named Seneca wrote, we drown children at birth when they are weak and abnormal. And this was not covered up. It's not thought to be embarrassing. It's simply the way that life was. In the ancient world, a child could also be left to die if it was the wrong gender. Anybody want to guess what the wrong gender was? A guy by the name of Rodney Starks has written about this. There were in the ancient world around 1.4 million boys for every 1 million girls, mostly because the other 400,000 girls were left to die. But there was this little group. See, this didn't change by accident, folks. There's this little group of followers of Jesus who remembered they followed a man who said, let the little children come to me. And they did. They actually began to take in abandoned children. And they began the practice of godparents who would care for children if their birth parents died, which happened a lot in that world. And then people began to leave children not to die out someplace but at monasteries, and that was the beginning of orphanages. These changes became so powerful, and there's a lot more to them around children, the way that they were used for slavery, for sexuality in the ancient world. These changes became so powerful that one book about them is simply titled, When Children Became People, The Birth of Childhood in Early Christianity. Widows who were actually fined by Rome for surviving past their husbands because they were considered a drag on the economy, were taken in and cared for by the church, which remember Jesus telling his friend to care for his widowed mother. Jesus began a revolution in the view and the status of women that changed a civilization and will yet one day change the world. In the first three centuries of the church, There were two major epidemics. This is just his impact on history. Whatever you think about religion or divinity. First two centuries of the church, there were uh, two epidemics that wiped out up to a fourth, maybe even a third, of the entire population of cities. Now you imagine that going on in our world. One ancient writer says it created such a panic in the general population in the Roman Empire that at the first onset of the disease, they pushed the sufferers away and fled from their dearest, throwing them into the roads before they were dead and treated unburied corpses as dirt, hoping thereby to avert the spread and contagious of fatal disease. But people in this strange little community called the church would actually go out into the roads and bring sick people they did not know and to whom they were not related and care for them at risk of their own health because this Jesus that they followed cared for lepers and the blind and the deaf and the lame and the mute and said, whatever you do for the least of these, you do for me. Do you understand how that vision, that idea gripped a world? In the fourth century, what was essentially the first hospital was begun by a follower of Jesus named Benedict. By the 6th century, 
Monastic communities would commonly have hospitals attached to them. And over time, this idea that we ought to have compassion on any human being who is suffering or weak began to take root more broadly so that by the Geneva Convention, an organization was begun to alleviate human suffering and it chose as its symbol a large cross on a flag known as the Red Cross. When you hear of groups like the Salvation Army or World Vision or the YMCA or the International Justice Mission or Goodwill or Easter Seals or Habitat or Compassion International, When you go to hospitals and they have names like Good Shepherd or Good Samaritan or St. Anthony's, you see the touch of Jesus. The autistic child or the Down syndrome or the disabled or the mentally ill or the broken. These were viewed by our ancient ancestors as burdens to be discarded. We drown them. To see them instead as bearers of divine glory who can touch our conscience and teach and ennoble us all and are worth the best sacrifices that we have to give. This is what Jesus saw that changed the world. This is not to say that there would be no compassion in the world without Christianity. And very often, those of us who call ourselves Christians fall far short. And if you're a follower of Jesus, if you're leading a church or a mission for there to be express, a fresh explosion of compassion in our day, would be a fabulous thing. But one scholar writes this, if you ask what is Jesus' influence on medicine and compassion, I would suggest that. Wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lowly, schools, hospitals, hospices, orphanages, for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. Who was this man? And then the Jesus movement shaped education. Shaped education. Again, little known in our world. Human beings have always loved to learn. People always love this. But in the Greco-Roman world, Formal education was virtually always reserved for male children in elite families. Not generally for girls, certainly not for slaves. But there's this odd community called the church. They remember they followed a man who taught everybody. And his last command to them was to go out and teach everybody. And they began to teach everybody, men and women. Slave and free. About the fourth century, some of Jesus' followers entered into monastic communities. And for many centuries, these were the only institutions of Europe for the preservation of not just biblical texts, but also the great pagan classical texts. And then churches began to build schools. And then arose universities. Most folks do not know this. Paris, University of Paris, about the 12th century, and then Cambridge and Oxford, the motto of Oxford University. The motto of Oxford University is, the Lord is my light. And eventually Harvard and Yale, 92% of all colleges and universities started in the U.S. before the Civil War were founded in this man's name. When the Reformation came, the idea arose that every individual ought to be able to read the Bible for themselves, which ignited a dream for universal literacy. Martin Luther took this so seriously, he said he would write a book about parents who neglect the education of their children. And I quote, he wrote, I shall really go after the shameful, despicable, damnable parents who are not parents at all, but despicable hogs and venomous beasts devouring their own young." Luther had a hard time expressing his emotions sometimes. (laughs) In America, in this country, the first law to require public funding for mass education, I'm not making this up, this is in Massachusetts in the 17th century, first law to require public funding for mass education was called the Old Deluder Satan Act because it was crafted by followers of Jesus who believed that ignorance was a, a dark satanic thing, and that God wants people to learn. God wants all people to learn. Because education honors God. It enables us to think God's thoughts after us. In fact, Alfred North Whitehead, who is one of the dominant thinkers of the 20th century, somebody asked him one time, what made it possible for science to emerge? This is a fascinating response. What made it possible for science to emerge? He said, it was the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. 
Now, this is not to say that science would not have arisen otherwise. But the fact is, as one scholar puts it, science as an organized, sustained enterprise arose only once in human history in Europe in the civilization then called Christendom. The greatest explosion of technology in all the Middle Ages were in Jesus' following monastic communities. Mechanical clocks got invented because monks needed to know when to pray. We actually first hear about eyeglasses in a sermon. They were developed because monks needed to pour over texts. Dom Perignon, I'm not making this up, Dom Perignon was actually the name of a Benedictine monk who contributed to the production of champagne because there were no Baptists yet to tell him it was a sin to drink it. (laughs) The alphabet... The alphabet of the Slavs, some folks listening to this talk, is called Cyrillic. They had no written alphabet, so a follower of Jesus, who came to be known as Saint Cyril, created one so that they would be able to read about Jesus themselves. In nation after nation after nation, it was people who follow and love Jesus that found languages that had not yet been committed to writing, and in acts of stupendous heroism, they set about that task. They still do. In many, many cases, the first effort at the scientific study of languages was from followers of Jesus. They compiled the first dictionaries. They wrote the first grammars. They developed the first alphabets. The first important proper name written in more languages than any other is the name Jesus. The Gospels, his story, are translated into more than 2,200 languages. No other book in history is translated into one-fifth that many. Who was this man? He he revolutionized art. Without Jesus, there is no Dante, whose divine comedy shaped the language of Italian. No Martin Luther, whose German Bible shaped the German language. No King James Version, which along with Shakespeare, shaped English. No Johannes Bach, who signed all of his works to the glory of God. No Hallelujah Chorus. No Mozart Requiem. No Gregorian Chants. And by the way, modern music notation is an invention of the medieval church, lovers of Jesus, so that worship could spread all over the place. That's how we got that stuff. Imagine, no Sistine Chapel, no Da Vinci Last Supper. There simply has been no transcendent vision of reality, no cosmic story that has gripped the artistic imagination like the vision of Jesus. And if you lead in the arts, would you make them shine with his beauty once more? Because the world needs that. The Jesus movement changed political theory. Jesus said one day, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and give to God what belongs to God. Now, when he said that, he signed his death warrant and forces got set in motion in Rome. But he also made arguably the most influential statement in political history. See, in the ancient world, it was just assumed that the state had the franchise on religion. They didn't even have a a phrase like state church because it was just assumed that was the prerogative of the ruler. And then Jesus says, no, there's another realm. And from Augustine to Martin Luther to other thinkers developed this notion of limited government that even kings will answer to a higher power, that the state shouldn't want religion or vice versa. And in fact... The church generally follows Jesus worse when it has a lot of political power than when it does not. Uh, In the United States, this year is an election year. Have you all noticed that? (laughs) What if this year, what if the main association people had between the words Christian and politics this year was the humility and civility of a people who remember their leader said, my kingdom is not of this world. He changed how we think about human rights and dignity. In the U.S., there's a famous statement. It's kind of core to governance here. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain rights. See, that's an idea. That's actually a whole package of ideas. Where did that idea come from? Because that was not self-evident to the ancient world. It's very interesting. You often hear people in our day say, I believe in a God of love. Where'd that idea come from? Nobody in the ancient world said, I love Zeus or I love Baal. Jesus brought from Israel to the rest of the world 
a new way of thinking about God and love, and it would change everything. When I was a kid, I used to play a game, Daddy's Home. When it was about 5 o'clock in the afternoon, I was a old guy. When I heard that door open, I would go running down the stairs, take a flying leap, and I wouldn't even bother to look because I knew my dad would be home and those big, strong arms would be outstretched, and I loved playing that game until one day. My dad couldn't even bring himself to do it. My mom told me I would have to stop. And I said, why? She said, well, it's not that your dad doesn't love you because he does. It's not that he won't always be there for you because he will. It's just that you're 37 years old. (laughs) Sooner or later, human arms grow weak. And and one day, this one man, Jesus, came and said, God is like a father who is filled with unquenchable love for every single human being on the planet. Now, this had serious implications. It was written... There is neither, and you think about these words in our world. This stuff came from somewhere. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Thomas Cahill, the guy that wrote that little book, that When the Irish Saved Civilization, Cahill writes, this is the first expression of egalitarianism in human literature. And it came from this man, Jesus. Now, often supposedly Christian individuals and nations violate this, but the power of Jesus has a subversive way of refusing to stay submerged. And that's why historically so often reform movements like the abolition of slavery or the elevation of women were overwhelmingly led by followers and lovers of this man, Jesus, who said, I'll give my life for that and do still. He uniquely taught love of enemies. The idea that you are to love your enemy is not a natural human idea. What was admired in the ancient world was you help your friends, but you harm your enemies. Conan the Barbarian. Anybody remember Conan the Barbarian? Was actually paraphrasing Genghis Khan, a historical figure, when he gave his famous answer to the question, what is best in life? And he said, to crush your enemies, see them driven before you, and hear the lamentations of their women. But there was once a man who said, what is best in life is, turn the other cheek. Go them two miles. Love your enemy. And those were not just words. When that man died, it is written that he said about those who were executing him. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they do. And his followers remember this, the life of this strange, obscure, penniless man and his death. They began to die the same way. Nero would take followers of Jesus and cover them with pitch And use them as human torches to light gladiator games. And this went on, on and off, for three centuries. And their response was not to dream of revenge or start an armed revolt, but to love. This association of this man, Jesus, whatever you think about claims of divinity, this man, Jesus, and love for enemies is so strong that a historian, not a Christian, Hannah Arendt, great Princeton thinker, wrote, the discoverer of the role of forgiveness in the realm of human affairs was Jesus of Nazareth. Who was this man? He inspired a man named Tolstoy. And his book, Resurrection, in turn, inspired a lawyer named Gandhi to start a community movement of reconciliation. The last letter Tolstoy wrote to anybody outside of his family was to Gandhi to praise this self-sacrificing love of Jesus. In the most famous speech in the United States of the 20th century, Martin Luther King actually departed from his script when he was at the mall in Washington, D.C. to quote the, the Bible that one day justice will roll like waters, righteousness like a mighty stream. And the crowd that was gathered there could not keep quiet, and they started yelling, tell it, amen, preach it, like a church crowd. 
not like a summit church crowd, like the kind that answers you back while you're talking. <laughs> and King could not go back to his script. Mahalia Jackson, the great singer, piped out like out of the choir, tell him about the dream, Martin. And he started talking. I have a dream. I have a dream that one day, and he talked about what it would be like if all children, every color, was to join hands. I have a dream of a world that is not yet, but that one day will be. That is not here, that's going there. It was not a secular dream. It was inspired by the one Martin Luther King followed by the Jesus whose name and life draws here today. See, the real question is not, who was this man? The real question is, who is this man? Who is this Jesus? He is the hinge of history. He is the hope of the oppressed. He is the inspiration of the despairing. He is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the greatest teacher that ever taught. He is the greatest mind that ever thought. He offered the greatest gifts ever given. He wants the greatest movement ever known. And the reason that we must... The reason that we must marvel at this man is his work is not done yet. Our world is waiting for a fresh conversation, for a fresh manifestation of this man in his vision. What might happen in the radical expression of compassion, in the waging of peace and justice, in the dignity of the marginalized, in the education of the left out, in the inspiration of the arts, in the call of the mighty to humility, what might happen if somehow the Jesus impact on your world were to go greater in the next generation than in any before? And why could it not be so? For still in our day, the call of the carpenter comes again to that man or to that woman. Follow me. See what I see. Love what I love. Follow me. Will you be that man? Will you be that woman? Will you devote yourself, whatever it costs, to that man and the expanded vision of his kingdom? Will you give your life to the man who was given for the sake of the world? For he alone mastered life. He alone conquered death. He alone overcame sin. He alone grows present with every passing year. He is the son of God. He is the glory of humankind. The crucified carpenter of Nazareth is the hope of the nations and the savior of the world. And that's who this man is. <laughs>